Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. In this episode, we're discussing fall movies we're excited for. We debate if Stand By Me is the perfect representation of friendship. And our topic this week is unlikable TV characters we also kind of find kind of lovable. Let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today are my fellow host, John Davenport. Hey, Aaron. How are you doing tonight? Good. Troy Heinrichs? I am back. What is up, everybody? Hello. Uh, Amanda will not be here because there's a storm over her house. There's a good chance that she had a tornado and she might be in, no longer in Kansas anymore. I'm just kidding. She's fine. She's fine. She's got a storm, so she can't join us this week. But what a great job last week, huh? Great job hosting last week. Oh, yeah. yeah. She was fantastic. God. Awesome time. Well, you know what really sucked, though, was the editing, right? Like... I don't know if you guys caught this uh, the first day it came out, but there's like three whole minutes that are not there, <laughs> that were not there. <laughs> they were, as some people might say, lost. Some people might say that it wasn't part of the edit. It was part of the person that posted it who didn't check the fact that there were three minutes missing from the file. Okay. Hey, hey, hey. Wait. <laughs> Wait a minute. The guy who edited it is ultimately the guy responsible for those re- those three minutes. I I would assume if I got a track from Troy Heinrichs, uh, podcast award winner that there would be an ending to the file he sent. I, I would probably make that assumption. So let's not try to pile up on the lady that's not here. Hey, hey, I'll, I'm just saying. Pretty fair. Assumption, ass, you, me, you know. <laughs> always check the file, especially when it's transmitted between two different places. Yes, you should always check your file too, because you're the one that transmitted it, it. I transmitted it just fine. I had the two minutes on my side. You did not. Just saying. I did. You did not. My Adobe Audition file and my MP3 file all were clean and correct. The download was it was not all on there. Yep. That's that's on the other side of the equation that loaded it to lips and that wasn't me. I've literally never just heard saying. of that in my life. You're like totally just pulling this like just your saying. ass has to hurt. It was not a smooth It is a removal. it is a Google issue. Google issue. <laughs> it's never a Troy issue. It's a Google issue. It's never a Troy issue. Well, anyway, if you if you don't if download our podcast uh, on Thursday instead of Wednesday, you get what I'm calling the director's cut. Or the editor's cut, if that will. Yeah. <laughs> or the editor's cut. The David Ayer cut. <laughs> and it's the best three minutes of the show, in, in John and Mai's opinion. Don't worry, Amanda, if you're listening, um, we know it's Troy's fault. Shh, shh, it's okay. All right. Uh, I do want to uh, throw in here, by the way. So that episode, the clip that you played, John, which you know I'd never let you play if I was here, so... I get yep. why you throw it in there when I was gone. We we got no we got no guesses on that one. I, Nobody I didn't, guessed on it. I've never even heard of that, and I've heard a lot of. I don't even think I've jokes. seen the movie until you sent the clip. To be honest, yeah, nobody. that is nuts. Funny. Ah. Uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, that happened. All right. Well, I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. I I'm sure. Everybody was pretty excited that I was gone, but I was in Alaska. I took a cruise to Alaska. I got to see the great. Northern wilderness, perfectly within COVID protocols. I fully vaccinated boat, the whole deal, but our ship, it's not a boat. Uh, and I had a wonderful time. I highly recommend you guys go to Alaska if you ever get a chance. Nobody gives a shit. That's great. Thanks, guys. Thanks. No. <laughs> I'm here to talk. Thanks for the love. Jesus Christ. Yeah, looking for Alaska was on Hulu and it was a few years ago. So we're talking about modern current stuff today. So we should just get in with the current stuff. What was on Hulu? Looking for Alaska. I didn't watch that. What was the name of a TV show? Oh, well, I, I didn't look. I found it. I was there. I mean, I literally, I was. Maybe I you should it. go back. So John and I can actually talk about the new stuff coming out this week. Jesus, yeah. man. Uh, he oh. is like, Troy is totally on your ass about pushing this podcast forward right now. He's got somewhere to be, which don't worry. If you got to be somewhere, just leave when you're, we'll be fine. We'll probably be okay. It'll be the three minutes that I won't send later. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, well, let's jump into like fall movies that we're going to look forward to. We're not, there's not much in movie and TV news. There's a Spider Man trailer. Ooh, uh, everybody's excited because it said Marvel at the beginning. We get it. So we're going to talk about the fall movies that we're excited for from September and October that's coming up. Uh, Amanda has a couple. I'll, I'll read hers off if I have them, but let's just talk about the movies that we're excited about. And there's a lot of them that are coming. One of them is Venom, Let There Be Carnage, but it's not actually coming anymore. They just moved it to January. So psych. Wow, wow, wow. But first, first up, this is Amanda's pick. She is really excited for Candyman. It's coming to theaters on August 27th, a spiritual sequel 
Huh? Spiritual. A spiritual sequel to the horror film Candyman from 1992 that returns to the now gentrified Chicago neighborhood where the legend began. I like the original Candyman. I, I don't know about this, but I'm interested. I'm not excited, but I'm interested. Trailer is cool. Well, weren't there sequels to the original Candyman anyways? Yeah, there's two, two sequels. Yeah. Candyman 2, Candyman 3. I think there's a I don't Candyman think they 3. were that great either. That's why this one's a spiritual sequel. It's not Roger. Candyman 4. Roger that. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's like Halloween rebooted a hundred times. Whoa, well, that's not that's not fair. Halloween has had literally a hundred movies, and Candyman's had a few. So this might be uh, Jordan Peele is the executive producer, and we know he's the greatest filmmaker of all time. We've heard that from that's right from uh, the other host that's not here <laughs> <laughs> quite quite frequently, which is probably why she's so excited. She has this one listed. Maybe that's why. Uh, what about the next one up, John? Uh, for so, oh, we're gonna do this in some sort of order. Well, no, I, I don't give a. I you don't list it in order on the document. I mean, you do what you want. Do whatever makes John happy, because obviously, All what right. I care about doesn't matter. I heard the podcast when I was gone. I don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Shang Chi: The Legend of the Ten Rings. Uh, Shang Chi is the master of the unarmed weaponry based kung fu. Uh, of is forced to confront his past after being drawn into the Ten, Ten Rings organization. This looks good. Uh, Buzz, I think, right now is pretty good for it. Is that right? It's fantastic. I mean, it's Marvel. I think it's legally required that everybody has to like it, right? That's the... I think so. It's like Marvel, it's... everybody loves, everything else is caca. It's too... it, was, it was good until yesterday. And then once the Spider-Man trailer came out, then everybody's like, Ching chi who? Oh, that feels right, though. I mean, it feels kind of sad. <laughs> they released a trailer that took all the hype away from their own movie because man they were getting a ton of the reviews were coming out their stellar reviews you've got aquafina in this movie she's on fire you've got a great cast tim roth's in this one too i love tim roth ben kingsley i think pops up as the former <laughs> mandarin so <laughs> <laughs> now now we'll have a different mandarin because that's what the ten rings revolves around right john is the mandarin yeah. that's the that's the whole mandarin thing so tim roth is in this is this is this pre him becoming um abomination or is this post him being abomination i cannot answer that question how i, I know you? the answer i know the answer but i cannot but if you go to imdb guys listening if you want to know that answer you can i am not going to spoil it for you but if you saw a trailer you know the answer to that too because <laughs> all right roger remember. that yeah, is that your that. new thing you're just gonna roger that and for everything i you know i i maybe yeah, why, why wouldn't they hold the theat the, the whatever it is now the teaser theatrical blah 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 all the freaking pre trip why don't you just hold that until the third and release the teaser trailer for Spider Man with Shang Chi exactly instead of doing it a week before and plus they're not doing that premiere access for this one you have to actually go to a theater to see Shang Chi so why don't right why wouldn't you do that so that people could see but I think what happened is they were it got on the internet I mean it got leaked to the internet and they were trying to get ahead of that they were trying to cover that that's all it was because people have the they have the the dirty buffery version they don't want that out there i mean the marvel doesn't want oh look at our janky ass trailer they want it to look sexy and sly that's why this sounds about yeah, right because there's a lot of people who are throwing out this idea that it was leaked on the internet first and uh there's like a, a meme they've created with with um uh romanoff leaking it to the internet <laughs> like scarlett <laughs> johansson's like Piss on you, Disney. <laughs> That's funny. I don't need your misogynist comments. Bam! It's out there. I like it. I actually kind of like that. I hope she did do it. <laughs> I hope Colin Jost did it. <laughs> it's a shame, though, because I remember those days where you, you said the, hey, come see this movie. And by the way, you'll see the first trailer of X if you come to the movie. Like mm-hmm. That would have been such a great marketing ploy. Yeah. Oh, man, absolutely. Star Wars, Phantom Menace. Remember that? Like, you got all... Mm-hmm. you got. You had to go see that in a theater, the trailer for that in a theater, and you just <gasps> goosebumps. Then you saw the movie and you just kind of died inside. A little bit. A little bit. All right, Troy, throw a movie at us. All right. How about Malignant coming to theaters on September 10th? It's based on an original story by director James Wan and writer Michaela Cooper and Ingrid Bisou, who actually stars in the film. Malignant features the characters of Madison, who is paralyzed by shocking visions of grisly murders, only to have her torment worsen as she discovers that these waking dreams are in fact terrifying realities it stars annabelle wallace who was jane seymour in the tutors she was jane seymour she played jane seymour yeah she was jane seymour in the tutors 
Like the actress, not, Jane Jane? C- not the a- actress Jane Seymour. It's no. the, <sighs> the actual historical fi- figure of Jane Seymour. Didn't know there was one. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. I There's only one Jane Seymour in my world. I'm sorry. And that's Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Right. That's right. Mm-hmm. I, d- I did I w- not know that Annabelle Wallace played Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, but didn't actually play Dr. Quinn, played Jane Seymour, who then played Dr. It's a fantastic performance. Call her kid. Yeah. Dr. Quinn was actually in the Tudors. Now that would be an interesting sight. That would be interesting. <laughs> that would be weird as shit, but yeah, that'd be interesting. <laughs> uh, my first one is going to be Cop Shop. On the run from a lethal assassin, a wily con artist desi- devises a scheme to hide out inside a small town police station but when the hitman turns up at the precinct, an unsuspecting rookie cop finds herself caught in the crosshairs. And it comes out September 17th. And it's got Gerard Butler, Frank Grillo. I love Frank Grillo. And directed by Joe Carnahan, who did the A-Team. He did Boss Level. He makes fun-ass movies. This we'll Watch the trailer. Cop Shop looks like a blast. That does look like a blast. All right, so we're, we're going to go back to the 10th, and we have uh, the car- card counter. Redemption is a long game in Paul Schrader's The Card Counter. Told with Schrader's trademark cinematic intensity, a revenge thriller tells the story of an ex-military interrogator turned gambler haunted by the ghost of his past. You know how it is. Directed and written by Paul Schrader, uh, stars Oscar Isaac, Willem Dafoe, and Ty Sheridan. It's a good cast. It's a pretty solid cast. No, and then the the the, the pictures and the, the trailer for it look fantastic. Uh, Amanda's next one, Queen Pins. <laughs> it's a pair of housewives that create a $40 million coupon scam and stars Kristen Bell. And it comes to theaters in September 10th. That sounds fun. That does sound fun. So there's some, there's definitely some fun stuff coming out in the next couple months. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of more fun, we have on September 10th also on Netflix, Kate. An assassin has 24 hours to get vengeance on the person who murdered her before she dies. This stars what? Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Yeah, before she dies, she Almost gets, like she gets poisoned. She's yeah, kind of like okay. that. Yeah. Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Woody Harrelson, and Michael Huisman. Whatever. Like, Michael it's, uh, Huisman. What? Huisman. Huisman. The Hill House guy. That's what we're going to call him. Hill House guy. Hill House guy. You know, yeah. Dario the second. Oh, yeah. He was Dario number two, wasn't he? He was the better yeah. Dario. Better Dario. But not good otherwise. He's kind of bland as an actor. Yeah, I can see that. Yes, you can. And everything he does outside of Dario. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that works. How he was so interesting as the, the Dario. Because like the first Dario had like that fake face that like just didn't move. Yeah, it was weird. He was kind of a weird, but he was so cocky. I kind of liked him. But yeah. In a weird way. I couldn't. I couldn't look at him, though. Yeah, it you was, heard it match the face. I think is what it was. No, I didn't. Meh. Weird. Troy, what what do you got next? You're really excited about this Dear Evan thing. Heck yeah, man! Dear Evan Hansen, the musical coming to theaters September 24th. For those that don't know about Evan Hansen and have lived under a rock for the last couple of years, Guilty. it's about a high school student with social anxiety disorder who writes therapeutic self intended letters to himself, and one of them is stolen by his classmate named Connor Murphy, who later dies by suicide. Mm. So the Murphy family actually mistakes the letter for being sent to Evan by their son. And the musical part of all of this is actually done by the team that did La La Land and The Greatest Showman, which I know Aaron liked both. So hopefully he'll be interested now in Dear Evan Hansen because the music is fantastic. I was not caring at all. And now suddenly I want to see it day one. You got it. I will. I got to now. I have to. Is it? Did you see the actual musical? I did not see the actual musical on Broadway because by the time I got around to knowing about it, it was no longer running or producing in an area I could get to easily. So it was a musical so, before. It was a on Broadway, yes. But this is this is a movie, right? This is a movie version, like a In the Heights it's not Hamilton. kind of style. It's not like Hamilton was. Not, it's not Hamilton, no. Okay. All right. It's more In the out. Heights. Yeah, yeah. I'll check this out. Uh, my, my next one, No Time to Die, October 8th, Bond. James Bond has left active service. His piece is short lived when Felix lighter or leader. I say lighter. An old friend from the CIA turns up asking for help, leading bond onto the trail of a mysterious villain armed with dangerous new technology. Mm. We've been waiting for this for like 15 years, I think. And yes, Feels about right. this is still going to land in the States on October 8th. They, they say that they're, they're committed to October 8th. But overseas, it's going to be delayed. 
which is the polar opposite of what it has been throughout this entire pandemic. That's weird to me, mm. but I can't wait. I, I'm so excited. I was so mad when they moved it last winter because when they moved it, I wouldn't have been able to see it with my dad. Now I get to see it with my dad, which I always see James Bond movies with my dad. So stoked. That's pretty awesome. You guys don't seem excited about this at all. Are you just more like it's going to get moved? It's it, going to get moved again. It's not. You shut your whore mouth. Why do you say that? Why? Why <laughs> you, you got to jinx your this? Mouth. <laughs> you open up the thing. It's like Venom's already moved. So oh, yeah, God. just wait that, for the dominoes to fall. That is Sony. They kept. They keep saying the U.S. date is going to stand. You don't think that's going to hold? If you're a betting mean, man. Uh, if you're a bet man. If I'm a bet man, there's no reason to move it other than theaters shut down. I mean, that's. That's really where we're at. So if they go back to like the bridge or the phase threes or the yellows or the oranges or whatever the hell the COVID stuff is, it's like, it, it'll probably, they'll probably bump it again. God, don't do that again. Don't do that again. Don't. I like my theaters, man. Just have us all wear motorcycle helmets. <laughs> right. I'm game. I'm game. Let's do that. I would love to see a theater full of people with motorcycle helmets watching the movie. I think that's the solution. That's what we're doing wrong. It'd be actually kind of great to have like the, the stereo system built into the motorcycle helmet. Oh man! So that everyone gets yes! their prizes. Yeah. C- yes. Com- complete immersive sound all the way around. Yes. Yes. I love it. I love it. I'm on board. I take that uh, over the uh, jostling 4D D box. Oh, and where I fly around all dead. God, it makes makes me sick. All right. Before we get on a weird tangent on this, I'm gonna go ahead Too and late. skip to October 22nd for dune i don't have to tell you what this movie's about this is the second or third remake of this whole thing but the cast of this looks amazing and it's i'm pretty sure they're not going to do the whole stupid whispering thing this time around but you got people like rebecca ferguson uh jason momoa zendaya timothy chalamet or charlemagne i don't know what the hell's name is i don't really care because you you got josh (laughs) brolin oscar isaac dave batista harvey or javier bardem and stellan skarsgård this cast looks awesome so yeah uh, i'm pretty thrilled for that i just like how you pronounce everybody's name a different twice in a different way I'm both times <laughs> <laughs> that's good still and still uh heavier half <laughs> are you ex- is this one i got a question for you okay because denise Villeneuve, who directed it swears mm-hmm. this is a movie that was meant for theaters he's been very vocal he's pissed that this is going to be theaters and hbo max same day because in his mind he designed this for the theater experience he does not think a tv is conducive to what he built his movie you can say what you want his movie he made it that's what he says do you feel like this is one you have to see in a theater or are you just going to watch it on hbo max because i know where you live you actually have to drive to get to a theater yeah, I have to drive like an hour and a half to get to a theater. So I'm going to end up watching this on HBO Max uh, because that's it's Choices. easier for me. Yeah. Uh, however, if I had the choice of going to see this in a the theater, I definitely would because this this movie, any of these movies, you look at the the original one from the 80s, you look at the TV, the TV movie that was done for Sci-Fi Channel. It is, it's supposed to be done with like a feeling of grandeur to it. You've got giant worms that people ride. Like, how can you not want to see that on a big screen? Yeah, it'd be like watching Mad Max, right? On a tiny 13-inch television. That, that doesn't right. work. Right. Or four-minute uh, Pornhub clips. Anyway, all right. So Dune going to be a flop. What do you think? You think so? I, I think well, I... there's no chance that's a hit. I have, I have no faith that's going to be a hit. That is one of those where I just feel like, mm, I don't think so. It's the it's the gamble of the sci-fi genre, thinking that they can make Star Wars or Lord of the Rings type magic. And I just, I, I don't see it having the same. It's, it's, it's really deep. popular in certain circles, but it's not mass popular. I, I, I buy that. The the thing that's a, that's really a shame about the whole Dune story is that people associate the idea of Dune with that first movie from the 80s, which is not a good version in any way, shape, or form of what that story was. Now, if you look at the, the sci-fi channels, this is when before it became Seafy, the sci-fi channels, like, miniseries they did, they did, they did Frank Herbert's Dune and Children of Dune. If you look at those, the story is so much more complete and so much less annoying <laughs> in a lot of ways and really gets you in into the feeling of this world. So, But again, it's one of those things that only a few people saw and it's it's really hard to get your hands on. That makes sense. 
the only thing I would say is that I, I feel like that that property, for whatever reason, is it's too I maybe mean, it's too analytical. I, I don't I don't know. It's too weird. It's kind of a combination of too smart for its own good, too weird for its own good, and that's why I think it's going to be very hard to translate. It's kind of like you know Blade Runner. Even though I'm not a big Blade Runner fan, I feel like that was too much of a very specific kind of science fiction to be popular, which it was. It wasn't like a huge hit. It was kind of a floppo compared to the budget and everything else, despite it being beloved by people that, that watched it. And I think that's what Dune's going to fall into that category. I just don't find, I think sci-fi only sells really well if it's fun and this doesn't look like it's fun. Yeah. Which is why like the matrix did really well, but the second and third movies flopped because it focused more on the cerebral in the second sure. and third yeah. installments than it did on the action and the, fun part of the first movie just an observation just an observation all right what's next troy well i'm super excited because jody comer can do no wrong at this point in time yes. so anything jody comer is in we are going to see it no matter what and then it's just an even bigger bonus that adam driver and matt damon will be joining her in the last duel in theaters october 15th in 14th century france marguerite de thibeville claims she has been raped by her husband's best friend her husband, the knight Jean de Carogos, challenges his friend and squire Jacques Legree to trial by combat. It is the last legally sanctioned duel on record in France's history. So it could have been a little bit of a historical perspective. Plus, did we say Jodie Comer is in this one? Oh, my God. She's, she's so wonderful. That sounds awesome. It's, the trailer was amazing. I was like, yes, 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 yes. Sign me up. And the, the first movie that has been written by Matt Damon and Ben Affleck in a long time, like I think since Goodwill Hunting, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's been a while. And it's interesting that they're, they wrote that story because it seems like something that is way out of the re their wheelhouse. But um, but they would be because, you know, they usually do really good stories about Boston. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it's a little I get. Yeah, it's a little out of there. And ben Affleck's in that movie, too. And it should be noted, uh, Ben Affleck wrote it, Matt Damon wrote it, and Nicole Holf Center wrote it as well. And she writes all the female parts. So basically what they did was they brought in a female writer to convey Jodie Comer's role because they wanted to be accurate, have accurate representation of a woman in that position at that time. And I thought that that's a great, that's a great addition to their screenwriting process. I think that makes Absolutely. it work. Agree. Yeah. And God, it looks like a really good film. The only thing I would say negative, I wouldn't even say it's negative because I didn't care, but I know critics are going to jump all over this, is that everybody has a different accent in the movie. <laughs> like <laughs> Matt Damon sounds like Matt Damon. Ben Affleck looks like Ben Affleck with a Julius Caesar haircut. Adam Driver sounds just like Adam Driver. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is the truth. So if you're going for historical accuracy, let the accents go. Just don't be an accent snob. Yeah, you know, well, you know, the thing is that you, in your mind, you should be believing that those actors are all speaking French to one another. Did you watch right. the trailer? I don't believe any of them know how to speak French. Right. No, but my point <laughs> is, is that they're not faking, they're, they're not faking the French accent. They're just speaking in their own words. Sure. And using their own to, but, you know, the language that's actually being spoken is French. So we're just being, you know, we're just seeing the subtitles read to us and and stuff sure what i'm hoping hap this is what i hope and ha hope hoping happens this hoping is I, this is what i hope happens you remember uh hunt for red october how yes. they spoke russian zoomed the camera into the lips and then pulled out and it's sean connery in a scottish accent which is just weird yes okay mm -hmm. but that's how they they conveyed that you know yes it's russian but this is the actor we're not gonna do a fake Russian accent to this whole thing. We're not going to try to have right. him speak Russian. I hope they do that with each character. <laughs> <laughs> each one of them. And every one of them has a different accent. I think that would be amazing. So this next movie, uh, there's two different dates for it right now. I can't figure out which one's the real one. It's either going to be October 22nd or November 3rd. It's Harder They Fall. Uh, when an outlaw discovers his enemy is being released from prison, he reunites with his gang to seek revenge. This is a Western. The stars Idris Elba, Zazie Beat, Jonathan Majors, Gina King, and, you know, just a really fantastic cast. It looks like a lot of fun. Like, it's a fun trailer. Yeah, absolutely. It was very exciting. Uh, and I do want to mention Halloween Kills is coming out, which, here's a description. Michael Myers kills people. There you go. <laughs> Jimmy Lee Curtis comes back. There you go. Comes out in October, I think, 15th. 
I mean, I don't have anything more to say about that. That's literally what it's about. Michael Myers kills people. And if you watch the trailer, you know basically everything that's going to happen, I think. Well, I mean, you could say that about any of those Friday, Friday the 13th Michael Myers movies, right? Uh, Friday the 13th was always a surprise. I was very pleasantly surprised every time. Like about the third or fourth time he's beating some chick against a tree in a, in a sleeping bag. You're still like, wow, that still blows my mind. I feign surprise every time. What? Okay. what? I didn't see that coming. Why is he picking up a machete? <laughs> <laughs> All right. On October 29th, we have Antlers. This is something that we've been waiting for for a long time. It seems like, uh, you know, something has happened between now and the last time we talked about this, but I don't know what it could be. In an isolated Oregon town, a middle school teacher and her sheriff brother become embroiled in the in her enigmatic student whose dark secrets lead to a terrifying encounter with a legendary ancest- ancestral creature who comes before them. So it stars Carrie Russell and Jesse Plemons and some kid that you haven't seen yet. <laughs> Jesse Plemons is in it. I'm going to watch it sincerely. Yeah. Like, I mean, even though he, this is going to sound so mean. I, I can gauge his career by his weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's so raw. Isn't that mean? I just wow. feel like you should mean, but. You should be kicked off this show. Kiss my ass. So... Every time somebody watches one of his movies, the wh- wh- whoever I'm watching it with, the first thing they say is, He's getting weight since the last thing. And no matter what yeah. movie it is, that's the that thing that comes up. I love him. I think he's a great actor. And honestly, just very, very talented. I'm just glad he's finding his way. It's just something that keeps coming up. Just finding his weight? I come, from, <laughs> I come from a fat family. I think it gives me carte blanche. I can say that. If not, I don't know. Cancel me or whatever. I'm just, uh, it's just a noticeable thing. I think he's just putting on sympathy weight because uh, uh, Kristen Dunst was pregnant. <laughs> what? It's sympathy weight. You know what happens sometimes? Some some guys, I like their wife gets wor- pregnant. I think you're worse. You're going worse. Just let it go. I don't know what that was. I don't like it. What are you talking about? The wife gets pregnant. The guy puts on all the weight. It happens. I don't think it happens. I've got two kids and I was already just fat. So. Well, you did it. You got a head start. <laughs> I was preparing for children. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be sympathetic. I adopted. So apparently I'm all good. <laughs> right. You are. You're helping. That's that's wonderful. You should be there proud of that. You bought kids. It's cute. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> God damn, dude. I didn't, buy, I didn't buy anything. The government refunded it. <laughs> you rented your children with an option to buy? You know, you know. We sh- in talking about children, uh, Clint Eastwood is actually back on the map. <laughs> what? And he's charged with <laughs> trying to get a boy. Because he's, not, he's so Mexico. close to the soul train to come back as a child. Is that what you're trying to connect? <laughs> No, the, in the movie Cry Macho coming up, an ex-radio star, Mike Milo, is hired by his former boss, Howard Polk, to kidnap his Mexican son, Rafael, and transport him back to Texas. Mm. So this is a, a neo-Western that uh, hopefully is going to put Clint Eastwood back on the map with uh, doing some acting and directing at the same time again. I mean, he's a very talented actor and director. Was he ever off the map? Yeah, he was ever off the map. That's why I'm trying to understand where... Did you just think back, he went missing? I mean, coming back to like a Western feel for Clint because he hasn't done a Western in a oh, while. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, that's okay. fair. You know what's weird? I mean, I remember like a decade ago, he said he was done acting. He was just going to direct. And he keeps popping up like every couple of years playing. This Get movie. off my lawn. That guy, the same guy. But he's still doing it and doing it well. Doing it and doing it and doing it well. Great. Now we're going to trademark infringement. Okay. And that's uh, <laughs> going to come out September 17th tentatively right now. Uh, by Warner Brothers, which means it'll also be on HBO Max as well. And you had another one that makes me chuckle, Troy. What, The Eyes of Tammy Faye? Yes! That sounds amazing. I saw the trailer for this uh, last weekend, and I was fascinated by Jessica Chastain's portrayal of Tammy Faye. So I am really curious to see how her working opposite Andrew Garfield, who's playing Jim Baker in this plus I love Cherry Jones. I think it's just going to be a fantastic um, piece to just go under who Tammy Faye really was and how she was able to uh, do the things charitably she was able to do. In, even though we all know the whole story about the bakers. And I think it's just going to be a very interesting piece that'll go in for potentially some of those late awards as the award season comes along. There's actually an article that came out just today about uh, Jessica Chastain complaining about how the eye makeup has damaged her eyes, her skin her around skin. her eyes. Yeah, her skin. Yeah. yeah. Poor thing. It is. He- it was heavy. Even the trailer, you're like, wow, that is um, 
I don't know if that wins makeup awards or not wins makeup awards because it is just so much eye makeup. Hang on. John, were you basically knocking her complaint? Were you, were you saying, just stop it? Is that what you're... No, no, no. If that's, no, that's I, the vibe I, I got. I just, it was like, man, I feel bad for you, Jessica Chastain. That had to be so hard, so difficult. John's like, I think you're kind of being whiny. I'm just saying, a little bit whiny. Well, she could use those dollars that they paid her to, you know, all the, all that money to dab her eyes with. I mean, like, that's what it takes. However, I think the person of Tammy Faye Baker is a fascinating individual as far as uh, hopefully when history really starts telling her story more. Agree. Uh, last one from Amanda. Last night in Soho, which is Edgar Wright's newest movie, and also he was one. He's one of the writers and stars Anya Taylor Joy and Thomason McKenzie, Diana Rigg, an aspiring fashion designer is mysteriously able to enter the 1960s where she encounters a dazzling wannabe, <laughs> wannabe, wannabe singer. But the glamour is not all it appears to be, and the dreams of the past start to crack and splinter into something darker. What I find fascinating is Edgar Wright is known more for quirky, comedic fun kind of rompy films and this feels like a straight up thriller almost like a, a hitchcockian or something or brian de palma-esque thriller is what it feels like so i'm a little surprised and curious about that as one i've not gotten my eyes on at this point so i'm curious this sounds like it'd be interesting yeah, yeah i'm with you guys like that does like I, I it's not something that was on my radar but i'm definitely gonna go ahead and put it on my radar now you must you must all right. Well, I think unless anybody else has any honorable mentions, we're good, right? I think we're good. I think we're good. So next time somebody says that there's no movies playing, I disagree. There's a lot of stuff coming out, man. Theaters, a lot of this stuff will be sure it will be streaming as well or streaming shortly thereafter. Oh, there is one more I had to mention. I almost forgot about this. Many Saints of Newark comes out October 1st, which is the the prequel for Tony Soprano and stars his son. I... I'm not a huge Sopranos fan. I never finished the series. I know the ending. I watched the last episode and I watched some of the other seasons, but I didn't watch the entire series. You know, I know, curse me. So I was never a huge fan, but the movie looks really good. And I'm kind of surprised by that, but I'm interested. Maybe the prequel will cause you to watch the actual TV show. Who knows? Probably not. There's a lot of years there and I've already moved on. <laughs> I'm like down the road, man. I'm on the new. new, new, new it doesn't new. even fit the right format of TVs anymore. This is true. There you go. Is it pan and scan? It's it's four you know, three. You put the TV. The, the, it's still four three on the show, the the, the oh, old shows. So. I hate that. You know when you watch early seasons of Buffy now, and it's just like oh, I don't I don't know if I can watch this now. I just oh. yeah. boxes on the sides of the TV. I can't do this. Come on. <laughs> we're so snobs. <laughs> we are, but you know what we're not snobs about giveaways. But before we get to our giveaway this week, we want to tell you about Snake Eyes. You can get early access to Snake Eyes, G.I. Joe Origins on digital today. In this action-packed adventure, the critics are calling the best G.I. Joe movie yet. The iconic hero Snake Eyes rises to become the ultimate warrior in the battle against Cobra. And also, with this, you can go deeper into the world of Snake Eyes with an all-new bonus short film, plus deleted scenes, and more with special features that are available at select retailers. Henry Golding, from The Gentleman and Crazy Rich Asians, stars as Snake Eyes with Andrew Koji who was in Warrior as his iconic rival, Storm Shadow. This nonstop action adventure is brought to you by the director of the Divergent series and producers of Star Trek Beyond and blockbuster action franchise Transformers. We love our Transformers. You can buy Snake Eyes G.I. Joe Origins on digital today, and you get all new special features, including a bonus short film like I talked about, those deleted scenes, and a lot more. Available at participating retailers. It's rated PG-13 from Paramount Pictures. And hey, if you want a chance to win your own digital copy of Snake Eyes, then email us at contests at thehollywoodoutsider.com. That's contests at thehollywoodoutsider.com with your name and the subject line, I roll the Snake Eyes. That's I roll the Snake Eyes. And you'll be entered for a chance to win one of five digital copies we're giving away. Do it by September 3rd for your chance to win. September 3rd. Okay, now we're going to our From the Outside In topic. <laughs> This week our From the Outside In topic is unlikable TV characters you find quite lovable. This topic spawns from Roy Kent from Ted Lasso. Maybe even Braun from Game of Thrones, but right now, but really like at the height of popularity right now is Roy Kent from Ted Lasso because this is a character that if you started watching Ted Lasso last year, he was kind of just a dick. 
he's really kind of a dick. But as the show goes, he's become more and more lovable. And that's what we're going to talk about. Unlikable TV characters that you eventually find quite lovable. Now, Troy, do you find it easier to love unlikable characters on TV than, say, in real life? And, you know, you run into somebody who had the same characteristics as a Roy Kent. Would you want to be friends with them? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because I try to look for the best in people and don't make real snap judgment first impression decisions. But at the same time, I really try to surround myself with people of character and moral standing. And if you just if you say something that's going to trip my trigger like the wrong way almost immediately, I'm probably not going to be around in the relationship long enough to be able to see the good in you over the long haul. And I think that's one thing that TV allows us to do is that you get that kind of irksis feeling you know, right at the beginning of the first or second episode. But by episode 10, you're like, oh, okay, I could see where the journey is going and how they're getting better. And I want to invest in them and see what happens. So I think from that perspective, it's it's definitely easier on TV to say, yes, that person was a horrible human being, but I kind, I kind of understand versus in real life. Real life is challenging because you have to give a lot of your time in order to make that journey happen. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. It's just it's there's a lot of people out there who I love on television that I would I would I I think sometimes to myself, God, I want to really hang out with that person. But at the same time, I look at that person. I'm like, no, I would be a target for that person. (laughs) And I I don't want to be a target for anybody. And I don't have the energy to put into a relationship that would that will just suck the energy out of me. I just don't want it. But again, at the same time, I I love that barrier of the television between some of these people so that I that I can I can enjoy them for what they are and and uh you know sometimes we want to be kind of like some of these people but um at the same time the reason why they're written so well is because they're a team of writers writing them and the the performers obviously the performers oh yeah obviously oh, yeah. too i mean I, i'm i've been horribly surprised because i really didn't like roy ken as a character the first season not just because i didn't think he was unlikable or just unlikable it just i'm like he just seems like a just always angry. I don't, oh God, but he's really, he's grown on me like this season. And, you know, John and I were talking earlier, Dan Fielding, one of my favorite TV characters of all times, not a likable dude. He's, he's really kind of a jerk. He's a jackass all through and through. He's an asshole on the same token. He's my favorite character on that show. I love him to death. And every once in a while he would on night court and every once in a while he would do something very, um, sympathetic or empathetic or just loving in a way, but he never wanted anybody to know it. And then, so you kind of see the uh, the underlying layers that existed, and that's a lot right. of the writing and, and the actor portraying that. Now, if it wasn't, but if I met Dan Fielding in real life, I got a feeling he's like a lot of lawyers, and I probably wouldn't like him at all. I, I would probably mm-hmm. despise him. So it's it's kind of amazing how TV you can feel completely different about people than in your real life. You know, and maybe it's because you get those layers, you know, sometimes you see somebody and you're, you're making, I wouldn't say snap judgments, Troy, I get what you're saying, but more like I've seen him a couple of times and he's always kind of the same guy. Well, I've seen Dan Fielding numerous times and it took a, a couple of years before we saw the real warmth of his character. So maybe that's part of that, you know, because you get those layers, you get the underneath part. Yeah. And what a interesting journey, I guess, would be the case for Brett Goldstein. Oh, wow. Because yeah. When he was like, he was writing the character for Ted Lasso. He wasn't even in the conversation to be Roy Kent. And then he's just like, you know, like, I want to try to be Roy Kent. And then he just goes in there and just nails the audition and, and embodies Roy from the get go. So, I mean, what a what a cool story to be, you know, writing, but also acting the same person you're creating and having that full control over that character. That's just got to be super, super fun for him. And, and different from. You know, Sudeikis is creating the Ted Lasso show and whatnot because Goldstein had at that point not known that he was going to be Roy Kent. He just loved that character and thought he could be that character and asked to audition and won that character. So, I mean, that's like a totally different journey from a guy who creates a show for himself or something. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, TV's full of unlikable characters, but can you remember a specific moment where you switch from not liking a character to starting to fall in love with them, John? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the one that come to mind came to mind the easiest is that uh, is Spike from Buffy. So, uh, you know, he's in- initially a villain. He develops this weird obsession with Buffy. Then he gets kind of rapey and weird, and he's hard to deal with. And it's really turns the show kind of mopey. And and thank God, you know, spoilers. 
he he dies at the end of the series of Buffy, but then he comes back to life in Angel, and he's a com- like nearly a completely different character just because of the way he plays off of Angel. When you see the differences between those two characters, which are very much they're both vampires, they both have souls. Only one decided to earn his soul, and the other was cursed with his soul. You can go figure out who's who, but seeing Spike kind of be the heel to um, to Angel's like like straight man really turned that character around for me and he became one of my favorite parts of that show in that final season he's a hard one to like but he does win you over at the end he does not yeah i I don't like spike that much i'm trying to be an advocate for the fans man but he did do that horrible crap at the end didn't he it's not that he did the horrible it never should have been him to get the to get the victory never should have been him to get the victory man you hear that troy's telling you that you're wrong just so you know i am well, he never. We know. We don't know who got the victory. That's true. We do. In he came sense. back. He came back. He got to, boof, come back on Angel. Right. He came back that's on a, Angel. That's that a win. Look, that's a huge win. It, well, that was a win. But you know, all those characters had died and come back. So like, it was a thing. They were handing out like chiclets. Yeah. There was no big deal. It's you called know. no stakes, which means that his big gigantic momentous moment of like, I'm going to do this for Buffy. Yeah. No. Complete crap. <laughs> He p- picks on Angel every single moment. In that last season, Angel was really hard to deal with because he was super mopey. And, you know, he wasn't the cool guy he was at the beginning of that series. So to have him come up and like, especially especially that episode where Angel gets turned into a, a, a puppet and the elevator opens and he's like, you're a wee little puppet man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Trey, what about you? What's a, what's one that comes to mind where it really you, you really switched on a character? Oh, I mean, how can you not go to one Benjamin Linus in Lost? Ooh, that's a good one. There, I mean, the, from the get-go... Well, we probably like, could. How could you not go to Benjamin on Lost? Right. I mean, I could go a different way, but but, but Ben Linus... I This happened during the pandemic where I was, of course, re-watching Lost for like the hundredth time. And there was an episode that I got to in... I think it was in season six, and it was the Flash Sideways where Ben like gets constantly beat up and gets run over by the car and all this other stuff. And, and he has this conversation with, with Ilana on the beach and he's like, well, I'll come with you. And she's like, why do you want to come with me? He's like, because nobody will have me. Hmm. And I was just like, I don't know what it was in that moment, but I just like lost my stuff. And I've never cried in that sequence before. And I think it was like that, you know, whatever 800th time through that. I finally was like, I get, I get the character of Ben finally. Like Ben was this guy who was promised all these things and then never ever was put first or made to feel special. And like, you can just go like, I can, I, that's called like being a, you know, people are being a bully to him. And so that's why he acts out the way he does. And to, to kind of finally get like some kind of redemption at the end, obviously um, with his conversation with John, I, I just thought, you know what? Like Ben might've been an asshole in season two and three, but as that as that series goes on, you're just like, yeah, I, I kind of get Ben, and I understand his character, and I understand his plight, and you know, I, I feel bad for him, and I love the I love the character now. Yeah, you know what's funny is I I have I mean I have a bunch of these I could I could rattle off, but one that really I mean just kind of blew my mind, and it's a it's more recent, which I don't I don't usually like to pull recent, but I mean it's it seriously blew my mind because I've hated this character for thirty goddamn years, I hated him. Johnny Lawrence, oh. <laughs> Johnny Lawrence, and, sure. you know, in Cobra Kai and shout out Jennifer Miller. I know in our group, she, she mentioned him too, but he is, he is a character. I've, I hated him in Karate Kid. There was just nothing redeemable about him. I just thought, what a douche. He was just like a lot of kids I knew growing up. I mean, he was just a, a bully jackass. And then Cobra Kai comes along and this whole show is, is built around the fact that the Karate Kid is now going up against Johnny Lawrence again. And Johnny Lawrence is just down and out. And he's kind of his, his whole life was destroyed by that, by that moment, like sweeping the leg, <laughs> you know, that whole moment ruined his life, his own fault in many respects. On the same token, he never really took responsibility. So he's this very unlikable guy who's kind of rude to everybody. He's kind of a douche. He's, you know, he's had every chance in the world and he just keeps falling on his ass. He can't get his life together. And the show is, a, is about a guy who is redeeming himself through small 
but meaningful moments. You know what I mean? And it's such a goofy little show, but it does such a great job with character moments like that and bringing characters to where it's earned moments. And it makes you actually root more for Johnny Lawrence than Daniel-san, which I thought was never going to happen. I thought you'd never put me in a position where, even even though I like Billy Zabka a lot as a person, I had a hard time believing that there's any chance you're going to make me root for him more than Daniel-san, because I, I just kind of go for the underdog normally. And, and I guess you could say Johnny Lawrence is an underdog in the show, but you know, Daniel san has been with my heart for 30 some years. I love those movies. I grew up with those movies. They meant a lot to me. That character meant a lot to me. And, you know, he's, he's still very much the same character where Johnny Lawrence is still kind of a dick, but he turns into a better person. And I mean, it's, it's just been a show that really, really stuck with me. And that character has been very meaningful to me. That's a really good choice. I feel like I recently rewatched the, the series of How I Met Your Mother. And I feel like the whole fact that you had a character on that show talk about how Billy Zapka was actually the hero of, <laughs> of at least the way he saw it. Billy Zapka was actually the hero of Karate Kid because he was the Karate Kid. He wasn't some kid from Jersey, mm-hmm. you know, who messed somebody else's life all up. You know, the the light they shown on Billy Zapka the last season of that show because he got to be on the show and play with the idea of him being constantly being a villain, even though he's a nice guy. Uh, I always makes me want to watch Cobra Kai. I don't know why I haven't yet. You didn't even watch Cobra Kai? Uh-uh. Who are you? Is there an eject button from this podcast? Because <laughs> no, I am don't. just disappointed. Well, right Troy, now. you've actually watched it. Do you agree? Yeah. Billy Zabka is amazing. I mean, that was the whole premise of the entire first season was we're going to watch Billy try to become this guy. And Daniel son is a complete ass in the first season, especially those first couple episodes. And so, like, just seeing Billy um, Billy Zapka do, do what he does with the character and takes him to a completely different place, I think is absolutely fascinating. And I'm totally rooting for Johnny the entire time, especially when you get into the whole father son relationship between him and his kid. It's just, oh my gosh, like, yes, hundred percent. I mean, I felt I felt a little bad for him in Karate Kid Two when Crease punches the car. Yeah, and you can clearly see that like, Crease is not a good guy, but at the same time. Like he was totally an ass, but when you go back and now look at it from the perspective of Johnny, like Daniel was kind of like a jerk to him too. So it's a it's an even even playing field, and I, I really like where they're taking him in Cobra Kai. And you must sit down this weekend, John, and watch all of the three seasons because it's amazing. Yeah, they're only I'll get on that. They're only a half hour long, man. They will make you feel good. They will make yes. you feel good. They're so good. It's it's a heartwarming show. It's funny. It's charming. It's got heart-wrenching moments. It's a beautiful show. It really is. Cobra Kai. Check it out. All right. So who are some other TV characters you personally love that are often more an unlikable sort? Uh, so the first one I could think of was Walter White. Like uh, even when before he becomes the drug dealer, he is just like somebody who's, you can tell he, he thinks the world has been completely unfair to him. And as he even becomes more and more of Heisenberg, it that, that whole like he's finally becoming the big man. You can see how he, how he's enjoying the power is just, just nuts. And I I like him on screen for sure, but I would never want to hang out with Walter White. (laughs) I thought of that. And I actually, I'm the other way with him. Like I, I started out liking him and then just like despised him. I didn't hate him, hate him, but there's always like a little piece of you that still likes him, but I I no longer found him lovable by the end. I would give that to Jesse Pinkman. Because oh, yeah. I hated Jesse Pinkman for most of the first two, half, season and a half, really, up until his girlfriend, that thing happened. I, I thought he was just, I wanted him off the show. I'm like, wow, why is this kid? Not? And then it really, really clicked with me like, wow, he's a great actor. And now I get what they're doing with the character and I'm starting to love the guy. I feel horrible for him now, you know? Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. That's actually a smart character. It was, it was hard to really choose between which character because Justin Pinkman became somebody I would actually want to still hang out with as opposed to just keeping that that barrier. Uh, whereas he started out the show as somebody who I would never want to hang out with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe they should have made the sequel with him instead of uh, Aaron Paul because I didn't like El Camino personally. Oh, but I would have watched something with Jesse Pinkman's character for sure. Well, that... El Camino was with Jesse Pinkman's character. Look, 
Yeah, but it was fe- but it featured Aaron Paul, right? It was like Aaron Paul's like spinoff specific. It was about. Oh wait, you're thinking? I'm thinking Jesse Plemons. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Jesse Plemons was in the show. He was. That's why I was confused for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? I just sorry. I I couldn't see around him. That was the problem. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so i feel bad for ever bringing that up but it's still funny all right <laughs> troy what, what about you what's uh what's one <laughs> wow uh so sorry. I, I personally love chuck bass in gossip girl uh chuck was this slimy squirmy you know comes from money real estate new york thinks he was god's gift to women and i'm just the whole time I'm watching him maneuver and do the things that he does, I was just like, man, this guy's fascinating just to see what what he can do and how he manipulates the society. But at the same time, just such a just such a dick <laughs> to everybody <laughs> around him. And I, I just don't know why he's he's that lovable, you know, likable. But yet you just want to be like, oh, Chuck Bass, like disgusting. Go away. But yeah, if you haven't seen Gossip Girl, Chuck, Chuck is an amazing character and they do such a great job with him. I kind of want to watch. I've never seen it, but now I'm kind of interested. Sincerely, yeah. At least, at least the first season. If you don't like, I mean, it, it gets a little bit weird and crazy, and you can basically call who Gossip Girl is from episode one. But it's Blake Lively, isn't it? No, it is not. Doesn't she do the voice on that one? No, uh, Kristen Bell was actually the voice of Gossip Girl in the opening credits. Oh, so Blake Lively was the star, though. Blake Lively was a star. Yes. So what's the, what's Long the premise of the whole Easter. show? They're trying to figure out who's spreading gossip. Is that what it's about? Yeah, it's basically following the high society kids in New York that go to a pretentious school and there's like someone that just, you know, dishes all the dirt about their families and then the families start inbreeding and all that fun stuff. And then <laughs> what? eventually you figure out who the gossip girl is at the end of it. I'm kind of fascinated. I'm not going to lie. I mean, that's, that's kind of an interesting premise. Fair enough. The new, the new version, though, sucks compared to the original. The original is so much better. That's too bad. But you, you kind of figure that when they're going to reinvent something, right? It's hardly ever as good as the original. Yeah, hardly ever. John, you have another one? I do. Uh, Elliot Stabler from SVU. Oh, that's freaking fantastic. Stabler? Yeah. <laughs> He's kind of a dick most of the time. He is he he is the epitome of the guy and kind of kind of guy you don't want to hang out with. He ha- he's got the sanctimonious attitude. He's you know, uh, thinks he knows everything or if he doesn't know it, it's stupid and weird and doesn't fit into his whole way of life. So he gets to make fun of it. And if you if you say the wrong thing, he's going to put you into the wall uh, on screen. It's I true. like him. I uh, if I were to hang out with somebody like Elliot Stabler, I would be in trouble most of the time just because he would constantly have to, like, just boss me around and it would just suck. I've I've thought that watching the show because my wife loves SVU and she loves, you know, seeing Olivia and Stabler together. And she's like, they're a great team. And when he came back on the, his new show and she was so excited and, you know, I'm, I'm like, obviously it's because he's this domineering strappy man. But I promise you, if she knew that guy in person, she would hate him, which is fascinating to me because I, I've, you know, I know her. She hates guys like that. But somehow this guy works for her. So either it's because Christopher Maloney has just got great skills or great physique or whatever, or you just got the charisma. I think it's that. Is it? Is the physique doesn't? I think it's, well, I think it's his charisma and his great physique because he is, he is somebody who's fun to watch on screen. He's a hulking menace of a man. It's huge. But, and he's also kind of, nobody ever says this. He's kind of a bad cop. Oh, he's terrible. <laughs> he's constantly, I mean, at least if not assaulting someone coming very close to it where I'm like, I think that's illegal. Like, isn't that what everything that everybody's bitching about with police? Uh, that's what Stabler does, but everybody still loves him. <laughs> we can trace everything back to him. Yeah. That's what <laughs> put it all on his shoulders for sure. Uh, I'm going to throw one of my favorites. Chloe O'Brien from 24. Chloe O'Brien. Oh God. Yes. I feel like I've known people like her and I've had to walk away. If you've never seen 24 picture this, you've, if you work in an office or you wherever you work, the most annoying person that you work with is Chloe O'Brien. They're the ones that know everything. They're arrogant. They're full of every, like they just they know how to do every part of the job better than you do, and they're just pissed that you can't do it as good as them. That's Chloe O'Brien, and somehow you still come to love that character. That's hard to do, mostly because she's the right hand of Jack. So like you love sure. Jack and he loves Chloe. So therefore by proxy, you love Chloe. But you also kind of start to, I mean, wouldn't you agree? I mean, as you watch it, you start to appreciate 
how direct she is to people. In fact, you know, sometimes you wish you could be like that at work too. For sure. I mean, I love when people are trying to have meaningful conversations with her and she just looks at them with that face like, what do you do? Get back to yeah. work. <laughs> I don't care. I love that. <laughs> that is very true. She's she's fantastic for all those. Actually, I think I built my whole work life around uh, around being kind of like her. So it's been great. You wanted to be like Chloe O'Brien? Yes, Just... I want people to leave me the hell alone. <laughs> <laughs> Troy, do you have any other ones you want to mention? That's why he lives in the mountains now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Arvin Sloan from <sighs> Alias. Alias. Good call. Yeah. Uh, I know that's a surprise for me, but Arvin, I thought, was one of the most despicable human beings on the face of the planet, especially for what he does to poor Sydney's fiance in the very first episode. And I'm just like, like, this guy is like the worst evil of all evils. But at the same time, he is so smooth. He's so cool. He's got the right things to say. He knows how to get shit done. And I'm just like, man, like if I was running an organization, like I'd be Arvin Sloan for sure. I'd be like, can I be your right hand, be your security guard, something just I just want to sit by and learn from him because it just was so calculating and fascinating to me. I love that pick. I love that guy. I was glad with how his character ended, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly as it should be. Uh, exactly. Gentlemen, it was a great ending. One great more ending. round. Do you have anything else? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking Colin Robinson from What We Do in the Shadows, the TV show. Interesting. Yeah, he is He is not one of my favorite characters at all as far as like if I were to hang out with him. But he makes me laugh every time like he does something on the show. Like Every time he's doing something. And it's so subtle the way the actor plays him, which is Mark Proskick or Proskish, whatever it is. But it's P-R-O-K-S-C-H. But he's so subtle about everything. And, and, and they use him so sparingly that it always makes me laugh to see what he's doing. I will throw, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and just do two, but I, I want to, that way we don't have to come back to me. Carla on cheers, I think is, is somebody yeah. who everybody hated, but yet somehow loved. She's probably the epitome of this character, honestly, or Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker, I guess would be in there too. I mean, I did not mention Archie sure. Bunker, my God. <laughs> and also the roses on Shit's Creek, like the entire family. <laughs> oh, especially the beginning of the series. That's what I'm saying. Like they started as the most unlikable people ever. And then you come to absolutely love them by the end. Oh yeah, I would hang out. I would, but see, the difference is, I would actually hang out with them by the end. I would not hang out with them in the beginning. No, that, that, I agree with you. <laughs> like <laughs> roughly until season three, I wouldn't hang out with them. Right. Well, then should we finish on probably one of the best ones of all, which is former President Charles Logan from Twenty Four? <sighs> oh my God, that's tough, Charles. Charles Logan is just the most despicable human being in the world and the worst president, even worse than some of our actual presidents, I think. <laughs> but at the same time, his character added so much to the show that you could not not like him because it was the only person that ever got under Jack's skin to the point where he almost pulled the trigger instead of actually arresting him. That scene at the end of that fifth season when he's just face to face with Charles, you're just like, oh my, like, what's going to happen? Like, just shoot him. And you're, you're like screaming at the screen to like have Jack shoot him. And you know, that's not his character, but you're like, shoot him, just shoot him in the face. So for that reason, I just, I love what he brought to the character and brought to the show. Cause it was a great, great season. Yeah. He had this, this knack for displaying, a, a, I don't want to say a vulnerability, but almost, I mean, he was, he was a weasel for sure. And he did a hor some horrible yeah. things, but you also kind of felt bad for him. Like he was way over his head for most of his tenure on that show. Right. On 24. Yeah. And yeah, he had like a na naive ability to him, but yet still calculating at the same time. Yeah. He had naivete. He, he definitely had that about him. And sometimes I would feel bad. Like, well, maybe he's, I mean, I kind of feel bad. Like he's, he doesn't know what he's doing. Like he, he doesn't know how far he's gone. He, but then he would be so calculated and cold and like, okay, maybe he does. <laughs> I, I don't know. And then after the fifth season, they brought him back and yeah, he really kind of wins you over with a, a redemption ish story. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. You know, I'm just going to piggyback off of this real quick because I find Jack Bauer, somebody who I would never want to hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> you sure the hell would not? Damn it, John! Damn it, Troy! <laughs> I, you know, what schematic, Jack? What can I do? Oh, what can I do to make this freaking stop, Jack? Jesus! Yeah, if you really think about it, all he does is yell at all of his coworkers. 
Yeah, yep. all the time. All the time. What? A like the bully. only time he never yells is uh, he did, he didn't yell was in the first two or three episodes of season one. <laughs> and then from there on out, he's just like, "God damn it!" to everybody. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I love when they came back. Was it live another live another day? And he comes back, and he's just randomly killing people. Like they, he just doesn't. He's done. I'm just tired of even trying to dance around this. I'm going to shoot you in the face. <laughs> he shot that one dude's wife in the in the leg. I still think it's one of my favorite TV moments of all time, where he's interrogating a guy and he shoots his wife in the leg to get him to talk. And I'm like, Jesus Christ! <laughs> I remember yelling that like, Jesus Christ! He's my hero, and I tell everybody how I love this guy, and here he is shooting. <laughs> Spouses, that's not right. Is it? I don't know. It's the job done. It's the job done. Good conversation. You know, we had some listener ones, and I want to mention a couple of them real quick. Well, I got one from uh, Mag- Magnus Broman. Uh, he mentioned Gaius Baltar from Battlestar Galactica, which I think is a fabulous pick. That is a pretty fabulous pick. Responsible for the entire crippling of the whole human civilization against the Cylons. But yet, as his journey goes along, and you understand his plight, and his, and he gets into the whole religious concept of of what the Cylons stand for, uh, it just it's fascinating to watch his character morph as the entire series progresses over the four seasons. So yeah, that's a that's a good one there. Well, and also in that same thread, because um, we always post the topic in our Facebook group. If you ever want to join the Hollywood Outsider on Facebook, you got to search for it. It's a private group. You can participate in these comments. Stefan Smitebeck also threw in Admiral Helena Kane from Battlestar. Mm. Remember her? Good pick. From Pegasus, yeah. right? Yep, from Pegasus. Yep. That's interesting. Uh, I want to mention Marvin Sewell. He said, I don't know if it counts, but I was thinking Shane from The Walking Dead. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That was a guy who, man, it was so hard We're because- stooping his best friend's wife. Exactly. And once you learn that, it's really hard to root for a guy who- banged your best friend's wife dead or not (laughs) i don't care what you thought it's still your best friend's wife man there's the line there's a line and then he comes back and then he still wants her back and that's where it gets really complicated and it's hard to root for him but by the end you you kind of do because wouldn't you say that as the seasons went on shane seems more and more correct yeah yeah actually that is true every time that every decision that freaking rick tries to make leads to disaster you know if if they would have done the 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 shane way of doing things they would have probably been fine but shane dead (laughs) he's dead he's so dead uh reese bennett also said negan do you guys think negan is a lovable character despite him being so despicable no that's a hard one because i think that the I think the direction of the show and the writing of the show didn't do Negan. It did Negan a disservice, I think is what it is. Cause nobody likes the Negan episodes for the most part. Mm-hmm. If you take a random sampling at the same time, Jeffrey Dean Morgan plays that character so well that you have nothing but complete respect for his just gravitas in the entire sequence when he thinks he's all that. And then just how he gets humbled you know, as it goes along. And then even in these, you know, more recent seasons where he's now part of the community, it it just, it's a very fascinating journey to go. Like, I don't trust this guy any further than I can throw him. But at the same time, I really think he's misunderstood. And I, because of that, I I'd like to sit down and chat with him and just figure out what he, you know, was facing when he made these decisions to, to run, you know, the saviors, the way he ran them. Does he ever sit down or is he still like bopping around? Because every time I've ever seen him, he's just bopping around like a freaking. Yeah. In the jail cell pop. behind the doors, you know. It's like on a pogo stick everywhere he goes. I'm like, do you have, <laughs> are you okay? Do you, do you have <laughs> nerve issues or something? I mean, maybe you should get some, do you have a doctor around here we can get checked out? Because why can't you sit still? Jesus Christ. Hey man, it's a walking dead. You stay still, you die. <laughs> That's for you, John. That's for you. Uh, last one, Nate Bruce, Dwight Schrute. From the office and Ron Swanson from Parks and Rock, both good calls. Yeah, very good. Both calls. very similar characters. I would even say ways. Michael from the office because I would not. I I know people like I do not want to hang out with Michael from the office, but he's kind of lovable. I mean, Jan did at least, <laughs> and Holly. <laughs> at least Jan did. Yep. Okay, well, that's gonna do it for that. You know, any recent film or TV recommendations? By the way, real quick. I mean, I want to mention Free Guy. I saw Free Guy. 
and I know it's not a video game adaptation, but it's still one of the best video game movies I've seen in a long time because there's so much respect paid to gamers and the love of video games and what video games are like and creating this whole world. And it's extremely creative and fun. Ryan Reynolds is great. And Jodie Comer, as mentioned before in the show, fantastic. And she plays two characters in the movie. So she does range is what that's called. Kids can do no wrong. Not in my world. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But you guys, anything you want to mention before we move on? I have not watched anything new this past week because all the stuff I watched, we're going to talk about in our next segment. Okay. Same. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and move into significant anniversary. Normally we just talk about the movie a little bit, but instead we're, I just, one question. It's literally just one question. Stand by me turned 35 years old this past August 22nd, 2021 is when it turned 35 years old. I've reflected long and hard on this. And I mean, I've, I've considered some great movies, Goonies, um, Beaches even. I, I think Beaches has a play here. But I can't think of a better representation, at least in my life, of of actual friendship than that film, than Stand By Me. What say y'all? I would say Goonies would be the only one I could say would have a fighting chance between the two. Like those two movies, just the epitome of a, a group of kids who literally have their own little club. And then based on that club, they're going to do freaking amazing things because they're trying to save their town. I mean, Goonies is is definitely one where you could say that that those bonds that you create on that adventure are bonds you'll have forever, which is why that they, they should do the Goonies remake that we did on Remake This Movie Right. Because I think <laughs> that would be a fantastic comeback. They should. At the same time, I, I absolutely think that Stand By Me is one of those where it, it's a different time period. I mean, it's a little bit prior to the 80s where Goonies would be primarily stuck in the 80s because Cindy Lauper's music video is in it. So... I think that for the time period eras that they existed in, I think, yes, Stand By Me is definitely that movie for that time period where Goonies would be its movie for that time period. I think what's really great about Stand By Me is that they allow those friendships to be really real where they're slightly dysfunctional and but uh, but, you know, v- still very dependent on each other. And it still just happens to work no matter what. So uh, even even with the dysfunction, that's all a part of it. So that's where like some friendships come in that even though there's always a little bit of weirdness with some of your friends or, or you have to always apologize to about about some of your friends, you know, there's still something that's great and dependable about those people people that you uh, you cherish especially from that age so that's i i would i would say that this it's pretty hard to beat this movie you know and, and maybe it's because you know, growing up poor and everything else and a lot of my friendships were like this where we, we were walking railroad tracks you know i love goonies it's a fun movie don't get me wrong that's why i i definitely would throw it in the mix but when i'm thinking friendship man these friendships between these kids and stand by me was just so relatable even though you know, I wasn't around in the 50s or whatever. You know, this is decades later, but the friendship still very much reminded me of my own. We would, you know, razz each other all the time. We'd get in arguments or fights or anything else and be fine 10 minutes later. That's just how friends are. And, you know, it's funny today, you can't say anything mean to people or whatever. That's all my friends do. I don't have any <laughs> friends that say nice things all the time. And if I did, I don't know if I want to hang out. I don't want to hang out with Ted Lasso all day. I just, I just don't. Maybe it's a me problem, but all my friends say some very for like eight years. Yeah. You say some mean shit, you know, never really on the podcast, but Troy can be quite mean. (laughs) John will say it wherever, but I've got, (laughs) it's only to Aaron though. Uh huh. I've got, I've got several friends, like most of my, most of my friends are just, they have a razor sharp, mean spirited sense of humor. I'm okay with that. I just, I think it's fun because I know that inside they're not mean people. They're actually very sweet, good hearted people. That's the important thing to me. It's like actions, not words. It's always how I grew up. And that's what those friendships represent and stand by me. It doesn't matter what they say. They do the right things as friends throughout that movie to prove that they are the epitome of of friends. And they also, I mean, you know, friends part ways and they go take different paths and they, they eventually, you know, are no longer friends for whatever reasons. And that's kind of explained in that as well. And I just... The whole movie really just captures the beauty of friendship in a way that I don't know if any other film has really managed. Goonies is close, but like the honesty, the genuine honesty of friendships is really so prominent in that movie. Okay, well, we've got some reviews. Believe it or not, we had movies to review. 
we just kept them to the end. We're doing it different. But before we get to the reviews, share your thoughts on this episode or anything else in our Facebook group or on Twitter at Buy Popcorn. You can also email us, feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. That's feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Or our website is thehollywoodoutsider.com. You can find John's artwork on Insta and Twitter at rjohndraws. You can find Troy Heinrichs at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter, as well as on The Blacklist Exposed, and me on The Blacklist Exposed with that idiot, and presenting Hitchcock as well. Now, first movie that we're going to talk about is No Man of God. And No Man of God takes place in the years leading up to the 1989 execution of Ted Bundy as writer Kit Lesser and director Amber Seeley takes on a journey not only inside the mind of Ted Bundy, but of Bill Heckmeyer. Heckmeyer. Did I say that right, Troy? Am I saying that right? Yeah, Hegme- Hegmeyer. Hegmeyer as well. This is not the glorified rock star version of Ted Bundy that we see in this film. It, he's a quiet, reserved, troubled human that actor Luke Kirby, you might know him from The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, brings to life, according to Troy, with an amazing performance. We're going to talk about that. Both in his expressive nature, when Ted is animated, and even in the quiet moments when you ask yourself, what is going to happen next? So, Troy, what does happen next? I mean, we've had a ton of Ted Bundy movies. How does this stand apart? Is this something where you're going to get in, sit down, watch it, and be like, God, I've seen this movie a thousand times with Ted Bundy. You get it. Or does it feel like something fresh? No, it absolutely feels like something fresh. I think it focuses more on the, um, it was a Netflix series, Mindhunter, uh, yeah. that was all about the, the, the criminal profiling and this division that Ronald Reagan set up to try to really understand violent crime and, uh, special agent Bill Hag- uh, Hagmeyer in this movie. So you can't say he's the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wrote it a hundred times and that's why I can't pronounce it. Uh, he, he's the one that raises his hand and volunteers, to be the one that interviews Ted Bundy. Now, Ted Bundy doesn't want to talk to anybody. He doesn't want to do press. He got burned on a book deal. So to, to get an audience with Ted Bundy is a feat in and of itself. And it, it, the friendship that happens and occurs between these two men throughout the course of these conversations, I think is something fascinating to see and explore. And I think that this movie really dives into that aspect of it, of, trying to understand why Ted was the way he was. But more importantly, do we have those same tendencies? We just have a different way to not act out those tendencies, but yet they're still there underneath the, underneath the surface. So we've seen a lot of people play Ted Bundy. I mean, last year, Zach Efron played him and he did a very good job. So it wasn't bad. Then we had a documentary on him. So we've seen actually Ted Bundy. How was, how was Luke Kirby as Bundy? I can't speak from comparing him to other actors because I, I didn't really find any of the Ted Bundy stuff fascinating you know, initially. Mm-hmm. I watched this one specifically because I knew of Kirby and I knew of obviously Elijah Wood from The Lord of the Rings. And I'm like, these two actors together in a room seems really interesting to watch. So how close is he to Ted Bundy? I can't say. However, what I can say is, is that I could not take my eyes off of Kirby the entire time. I was just sitting there and en- en- enamored by the the way he chews gum, the way he moves his hands, the way he leans forward or steps back. It just all the mannerisms that he brings to the character just make you go like, what is the point? Because every time you're saying, what is the point? You're just sitting there going like, well, am I like that? Do I do that? Like it, it, and it really got under your skin a little bit as it went along. Cause he's so and normal. He point. Is that what you mean? Like, I mean, he seemed like he a perfectly no- normal guy. He actually has a line in the film specifically where they're talking about, you know, is Ted Bundy crazy? Right. Cause that's always the thing, right? The insanity plea. We're going to get him off on the insanity charge. Mm-hmm. And, and he literally sits there and goes, insane people don't kill people. Normal people kill people. And I'm just like, damn, that's prophetic. Hmm. And, I, and I really started to go like, well, what is Bill thinking of this entire time is Bill, the one that's sitting there going, oh man, like, and, and they even like intercut a sequence where Bundy is explaining how he would go about doing something if he were to have done so because he doesn't confess, right? But if he were to be one of these killers, here's how he would do it. And they intercut it with Bill driving down the road, following this woman walking on a, on the sidewalk. And you're just like, where is this going? Like, is he, is he, trying to act it out is he trying to attempt it is he trying is he is he in his own mind thinking that he's capable of doing these things and that's just fascinating to me just the human mind and the human condition and how bundy was able to get in there with bill 
yet at the same time not get Bill to flip over at the end. Hmm. That's really interesting, actually. How about Elijah Wood? I mean, I think he's pretty much great in everything, or at least very good. Where, where does he land here is Hagmeyer. Hagmeyer. He, the problem with Elijah is that, unfortunately, he did Frodo at a time where he no longer ages at this point. So, <laughs> so he's it's always hard Frodo. to like, yeah, he's always Frodo. So like, even when you're seeing him in this, you get that close up shot of like where he puts on the ring and you can see his big blue eyes in, in Lord of the Rings. That's the same thing we get here. You get a lot of like good close up face shots of Elijah Wood. And because of that, you're actually like seeing into Bill's soul as these conversations are happening. And you're just watching like the processing happen inside of his brain. And is he just trying to understand the criminal mind? Does he feel like he has a criminal mind? And, and, and I think just that struggle that you see on Bill's face, I think Elijah does a really great job like struggling through that. And it takes place over a three year period. They start the interviews in 87, I believe it was, and it ends in 89. Um, with some really good intercut uh, juxtaposition between the years uh, with some actual found, not found footage, but real footage from like the events that were happening throughout the course of the Ted Bundy saga. And I just, I just find Elijah to be really fascinating because it allowed me to like sit in that character as well as he acted it out. Now I know when you and I were talking and I'm re- reading a review, which is on the website, the Hollywood outsider.com. When I'm reading a review for no man of God, I, I'm noticing very much that, it sounds like for the majority of the film, it's two guys in a room talking, which for the most part, which to me means the dialogue has to be crisp. It has to be riveting. It has to be engaging. Obviously, the performances matter, but the writing matters too. So, does the dialogue, the the script, the screenplay, does it work? Does it pop? I, yeah, I think so. And I don't know if that's just because like Kirby is so good in just these mannerisms and the ticks and the delivery that it makes you want to absorb the script more because you want to see what he's going to do with it next. So if it would have been a different actor, could this script suffer a little bit? Probably. Cause I think I actually rated the story a seven uh, overall, if I remember correctly on the review. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it, I felt like it was just, yeah, anybody can just read a bunch of interview transcripts and then take that, write it into something else and then put it on the screen. I think what, what really makes it pop though is Kirby's portrayal and the way Kirby delivers the lines and the way Elijah reacts to the lines. So I don't think that the story itself is anything fantastically, you know, wow, I've never seen that before, but the delivery of it all and the pacing of it all and the use of the music in the, uh, in, in this thing just really brings the script to life. So what might've been a flat script on paper, the whole movie production really brings it up to another level. So this sounds like an exception to the, what some consider the video on demand rule, which are, you know, if it goes straight to video on demand, it's not necessarily great. But this sounds like actually it might be a great movie. So if ten dollars full price of admission, what do you give No Man of God? Solid eight bucks. So you loved it. Yeah, I was I was enthralled the whole time, literally on the edge of my seat, never looked away once, never checked my phone. I was totally enamored with the entire process. That's awesome. All right. And that comes out on Friday the twenty sixth. Twenty seventh. Yep. August twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Okay. Now we're gonna go to Sweet Girl and talk about this one real quick. It's on Netflix. So Jason Momoa is a devastated husband who vows to bring justice to the people responsible for his wife's death while protecting the only family he has left, his daughter. Man, John, um, this is tricky. You and I both saw this. This is tricky because you can't really say much without giving away some of it. Right. So what would you say about Sweet Girl? Whew. I think I would say, uh, without giving away anything about Sweet Girl, this is going to be one of those ones where um, if something like Memento kind of interested you or anything that's really cerebral interested you that has an action-y edge to it, um, uh, or something like John Q that tells a story about, uh, you know, someone getting revenge for his family, uh, that, that, you know, it has that sort of feel that I would say that if you like those things, then you might and you might find something to like in Sweet Girl. Yeah, it's tricky because I mean it's a movie where I think it's it's watchable, and I enjoyed most of it, but it really doesn't play until the third act. Like, right? W- would you agree with that? Like the first, at least the first two acts, you're like, where the hell is this going? I mean, and it's, I mean, I already explained it to you, but his wife dies because a pharmaceutical company wouldn't 
basically the prices were too high because she couldn't get the medicine she wanted. And then he basically just swears to hold them accountable and go after the CEO and stuff like that. And then there's a, it spirals from there and goes into some other stuff. Right. It goes into like a little bit of an espionage thing with like this pharmaceutical company and a news and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a vice reporter. And, and then it becomes this, this on the road, China kind of chase thing. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of elements here that it has playing with it. And, and, and it feels disjointed. And it's for me, the fact that the big, the, like the first act and the second act feel so disjointed from one another didn't work until the third act. And then only on reflection that I go, okay, all that made more sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and there's a great point. Like Jason Momoa, I think is, is very good. Isabella Merced is very good. Dora the Explorer, you know, as the father and daughter, I think they're very, they're very good. And you get Momoa action. I love that. The advertising for this is just basically thirst comments from Twitter. I think that's fantastic. Like there's, <laughs> there's some positives definitely here. I just felt like, there was definitely something missing, but then you get to that third act and like, oh, okay. I mean, I get, I get a couple things, you know? I mean, for one, he's not a great fighter for most of the movie and you kind of get why kind of near the end. Like there's, there's little things that, okay, it makes more sense. Doesn't necessarily make it a better movie, but it makes more sense. Right. That's the thing. It's like, it doesn't, it doesn't blow your socks off. It. Like if if this was in more deft hands and it was able to use because like the the shooting of it and the 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 feel and the environment it all felt very like like TV movie of the week to me yeah just, uh, and, and and that was a real, a real shame because it kept taking me out of what could have possibly be been a very interesting interesting story but it also lends to the idea that the person behind the lens and behind the story doesn't didn't know exactly how to put everything together and in, in just the right order or in just the right way to tell the kind of story they're telling it has good bones because the acting is pretty solid and the st- the ideas the ideas at play are really neat ideas it's just the the final execution when it all comes together is a little little bit lacking it's clumsy yeah so $10 the full price of admission what do you give sweet girl i gave it 450 okay all right i'll i'll go with that <laughs> i will concede i will concede now our last film is interesting because it's trashed by critics and it's called reminiscence. It came out in theaters and on HBO max. So if you have HBO max, you can watch it right now. And I recommend you do. Don't listen to the haters. Nick Bannister. I recommend to go watch it too. Well, yeah, John saw it too. Nick Bannister, a private investigator of the mind navigates the alluring world of the past when his life is changed by a new client, May who's played by Rebecca Ferguson. It's a simple case until it becomes an obsession after she disappears and he fights to learn the truth about her. I want to quickly explain, because me, Troy, and John all saw this film. Nick Bannister is played by Hugh Jackman, and what he does is essentially he helps people relive their past. And it's it's a fascinating idea. He basically just sets you back in a, in a cold tank, and you've got a little device on your head, and he talks you through it. He uses your voice. They, they set up the rules. There's definitely rules for how this works. And he walks you back into a point in your life that you want to remember, whether it's a loved one and you want to remember their embrace, or it's a, a, your child who passed away and you want to remember their smile, or it's you're looking for your keys and you can't remember. So he's helping you find them. There are different uses for this technique or for a prosecutor. He works with the district attorney to basically go into a suspect's mind and see if they did it, if they committed a crime to see if they did this thing. So there, there are multiple options for what he is trying to do. And Rebecca Ferguson's character of may starts out looking for her keys and then they fall in love and they have a connection and then she disappears. And it's the movie, the plot of the movie is how did that happen? What, what did she do? Where did she go? Why did she go? All these questions that he wants to answer, and he's obsessed with this woman, obsessed. And he has a partner in Tandy Way Newton who helps him along the way. You can tell she's kind of interested in him, but he's obsessed the whole time. And I think it's very important to note that there's a whole world here. This is kind of in the future, but it's very noir. Uh, there's a climate change element because the waters, the water levels are rising, buildings are submerging. 
Um, it's it's not quite Waterworld yet. I mean, Kevin Costner hasn't shown up, but it's close. It's getting close. So, Troy, when you think of reminiscence, and you know especially that people were kind of trash in this movie. I mean, critics were were really not happy with it. Some some viewers were not happy with it. And this is Lisa Joy's feature debut, who we know from Westworld. Troy and I do beyond Westworld, the podcast. And we're big fans of that show. And this is her feature debut. She's one of the creators of that show. When you think of reminiscence and you think of the world, because I want to start with the world building. What do you think about the world here? Yeah, I think the world landscape that we're introduced to through a really awesome uh helicopter drone flyover swooping from the main title all the way right up to when Nick comes out and he picks up this uh, queen of hearts card out of the water on the street and then pulls it up and you're on his face. That whole sequence was just fascinating because it really establishes kind of the situation. There was some, some big war, all of these people, all of our characters were involved in the military in, in some way, shape or form to, you know, fight the war and get to a point where these cities can now operate even though the cities themselves are only passable by boat or canoe or other means of water transportation. Uh, it's just fascinating to understand how you can have class society, I guess would be th- the best term I can come up with, where some people are literally living in streets that are still, you know, ankle deep in water and they walk in it like it's no, like I hate wet socks, but these people are <laughs> like just walking in wet socks all the single, all the time. Um, to the point of where there's actually uh, a group that is like the wealthy and they're literally on an island protected by, you know, the fact that they built up higher than everybody else. So you get this whole establishment of a class system very early on in the movie. And I find that truly fascinating to see like who are the haves and have nots and why are the have nots coming to this facility to get these memories back? Because it almost feels like a drug addiction at that in that moment. But you also have um, the high society type people who are also trying to use this technology to further their criminal empires. I I found it beautifully shot, beautifully realized, uh, just beautifully developed in terms of a world. And that's that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Like this, the story I will I will concede it's kind of predictable. It's kind of by the by the book in terms of noir storytelling guy gets obsessed pursues the leads finds the answers but probably finds himself going down a dark path to get there typical noir story now i will also say when you say predictable that's kind of i mean it's a double-edged sword isn't it because i mean so many movies that i love i rewatch, i know what's going to happen so isn't that predictable and i still enjoy them just as much i enjoyed this entire film story and everything else but a lot of that had to do with the world that was created and I feel like there are so many thought out developments of the actual world in reminiscence where like the rules for the memory game with, you know, the, the climate changes, like there's so many different avenues that have been put together and pieced together. And I think done very well because it, as it clicks for me, I mean, if, if you didn't like it, you didn't like it, but it clicks for me and seeing it come to life and visually represented and told this one. Like I rarely like movies with worlds like this. I I really don't. And this really connected to me. Like I really, really felt completely engulfed in this world. Like I wanted to go there and I don't want to hang out where it's wet. All that, like Troy said, I want wet (laughs) socks all the time. That sounds awful, but I had a great time with, with this world. And even though it kind of looks dire and it looks dour, but it's got this nice mix of future modern and forties. It's, it's like Mm -hmm. a perfect connection and culmination of the three. Like they just seamlessly go together. It's almost, it's noir. It's like Miami all all, right. (laughs) Miami right now is the future. (laughs) Sure. Modern and the forties. It's, it's, it seems like it's perfectly aligned. It's almost seamless. Now in terms of the story, I, I kind of alluded to, I found it to be a little predictable but where where did you guys land with the story and now john you you love the story is what you said yeah i did i you know yeah it's predictable you said it it's a detective noir story by the books and the thing about it is that and i think you were about to say that doesn't mean it's bad it just means that it's following the, the normal rules of a detective noir story and mm-hmm. 
they spent equal time with the story, spent equal time with the casting, and spent equal time with the the world building because everything is perfectly balanced. I, there's not a weak link in, in any of the things we see on the screen. And who doesn't want to play with these games of nostalgia? We do that all the time now when it comes to our movies and television. Absolutely. So like it, it really does address that whole idea of getting lost in memory and re- constantly re- reliving these things. And so there's a lot of feeling. And, a lot, and if you let, you let yourself open up to that idea, I'm sure you can get lost in that as well. Um, the the whole idea of a femme fatale that's not really a femme fatale or maybe she is a femme fatale or there's another femme fatale or the gal friday i don't know but it <laughs> they they juggle it just well enough to really really drive it drive the point home so that the ending is something that's kind of maybe a little uh waffled a bit but it still worked yeah and i love how they took the the memory concept of going back into back in time and it wasn't just a gimmick like, hey, here's this drug, you know, take your next shot of speed or, hop mm-hmm. or whatever it is. But they actually used it as a tool to solve the case that they were currently involved in. Like the case of why did she go missing? They literally go and look at other people's memories in order to piece together the clues that lead it down this, you know, you say predictable. I say, you know, you know, very standard, you know, logically concluded path. And I think that's part of the challenge is that where people think it was predictable and the story didn't have a lot of like, ooh, wow, pizzazz, surprise. At the same time, there's something to be said of the pieces when you stack up the Lego blocks all the way down the chain. Like if it resolves itself in the way it should resolve itself, I'm okay with that because I can go back and say, yeah, that's how this tied to this, tied to this, tied to this. And I think Lisa does a really great job of going through and actually making those connections and showing us where those points connect rather than trying to be some uber heady like try to you know jerk you around and and not really come to a a sensible conclusion um because there's there's times where you think you're actually in the real and you realize that you're actually not you're actually in a memory and then he gets pulled out of the tank and it's like three weeks later so that's where they kind of jerk you around a little bit but the way it works makes sense and it flows right there's flows it It flows it it flows flows. and there's actually this is one of the few movies i would say that didn't didn't use deus ex machina to explain anything right yeah and i'll be honest i i felt like i read some of the other critics you know i'm a critic so i'm not saying that they're wrong i'm just saying that they're not right they, <laughs> when you when you go through and i read some of the reviews i'm like i feel like based on the way that i i'm reading what they're writing they were looking for riddle of the sphinx that's a westworld episode so john you might not know that off but troy you know what i'm talking about right yeah for sure yeah, they they're wanted, looking, they wanted the the JJ Abrams mystery box. Yeah, they're yeah, exactly. They're looking for that really heady, heavy, um, convoluted but connected story where it's just gonna wrap itself up in this this riddle wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a conundrum or whatever. And then it's gonna blow your mind when the movie ends. But that's not the kind of movie it is. It's not trying to be that. It's telling a very linear I wouldn't say linear, but it is kind of linear. I mean, it does follow the flow of time. It's just we re- we get clues from the past as we go, but it's a very straightforward story, and it ends like you said, like very concisely, like to the point. You get to the end, and everything stacks up. To me, it felt like some of the negativity was people wanting or expecting a deeper element or a more heady element to the storytelling. Would you, do you agree with that at all? Do you feel like maybe that's a possibility? Well, I think part of the challenge with this one too was I think the marketing was wrong for this entire you know, stretch of the trailers, especially like when I saw the trailer the first time the what I thought the story was, was here's a guy who lost his wife and because he lost his wife in some tragic way, he's going to try to uncover the clues of what happened. But in the process of doing so, be so enamored with the past that he becomes stuck there, almost like a lowest level of inception kind of feeling. Mm. That's what I got from the trailer. This movie is nothing like that at all. Absolutely not one iota. And I'm just, because of that, I think I went in going like, oh, this is not what I expected. And because it wasn't what I expected, I just sat and went on the journey. And I think the journey was really fascinating and really fun. And I thoroughly enjoyed how he moved in space. And like, the, you, there's a really great sequence where um, they use these these memory machines, right, to go back and look at the memories but they use an older technology. And when they use the older technology, 
it's in black and white yeah, versus that. being in color. And I just think like those little touches are just so well done that you don't even pick up on it the first time when you watch it. You have to see it right. the second time to go, oh, I totally miss that. That's fantastic. And what did you what did you guys think of the performances? Because we've got Hugh Jackman, Tandui. I, I, I keep trying to say it correctly, and I'm I'm not trying to be uh, facetious or anything. I, I she just reverted back to her original name, and I want to make sure I I treat it with respect. Tandaway Newton is how it's pronounced now. And her character is Watts. And then you got Rebecca Ferguson as May. And you got Cliff Curtis is in here as well. Like, there's a great cast. What did you guys think of the cast? Because I honestly thought Hugh Jackman was pretty much Hugh Jackman. I mean, see, I've seen him do this character before and he nails it. Don't get me wrong. Like, he's fantastic as it. It's very Prisoners-esque, I would say, in terms of the role. I would say role. he's uh, yes. very, very prestige. Mm-hmm. Prestige, sure. Right around yeah. there. Yep. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson, very great as showman, which is kind of funny because with Hugh Jackman. But I felt like May was very similar to her character from Greatest Showman. Watts was kind of Tan- Tandy Way Newton's character from Mission Impossible 2 if she were Tom Cruise. So she was kind of a, she was actually playing against type a little bit. She's she's actually a bit like May from Westworld in a way. Mm-hmm. So what'd you think of the, of the cast? Hugh Jackman is somebody you can't really go wrong with. I was mesmerized by Rebecca Ferguson each time she was on the screen. And, you know, with with every flip of what they were trying to show you of her character, I still couldn't take my eyes off her. Tandy Way was kind of the heart of this story, and it really felt like she was the heart of it. And, it, and you know, for uh, Cliff Curtis being a boogeyman, he was definitely that. He was definitely a good boogeyman. So I really enjoyed the cast. I didn't, I didn't see a, a single weak link in there. And I think I loved the most about it was each one of these characters had some redeemable quality about them, but at the same time, they also had their drug of poison. Yeah. Right. So in the case of um, uh, Tandaway Newton's character, Watts, you know, hers is vodka. Right. And then the, uh, in May's character is all about being the seductive mistress and getting her way through her looks and her charm. Manipulation. Yeah. Yeah, manipulation. And Nick is all about, you know, this this memory device and just leveraging it to his own will and desire because he tells his clients he never goes in the tank, but of course he goes in the tank way more than we actually know. And that really pisses off Watts a lot in this movie because they're supposed to be partners and they're not. Yeah, and and I really, really was fascinated by the concept of nostalgia. The concept of you know, the past and our obsession with the past. And I felt like that was a great underlying theme. I mean, in addition to the world building, the the theme of that is something that, you know, I think John alluded to it earlier, you know, all of our movies now are basically nostalgia. It seems like we're always going back to the well of the past instead of living in the future or the now. And that's, pr- that's prevalent throughout the entire film. It's definitely causing what the, the problems that are in Nick's life are because he can't move forward, you know, and that's, that's a fascinating dynamic to to play with now i think there's a lot of other things you could do with that i think this is one of those worlds where i'd love to see a different kind of story told in the same world because i think there's a lot of different kinds of stories you could tell with this setup with this concept and i would love to see that i really i really truly will we probably won't because the movie wasn't a very big hit but on the same token i hope this is a movie that finds people down the road and becomes like a cult hit because i would love to see more of that set up being used in different kinds of stories because it was fascinating to me even if they make this entire thing into a feature park in westworld i'd be all about it (laughs) i hope she does (laughs) i hope she does i hope she adds it to westworld that'd be fine sets are already built why not (laughs) go to the past everything's about the past i mean westworld hell half of that is going back to the past right yep so yeah okay well i mean that that's really wrapping up the sum of of the film so uh, if $10 is the full price of admission, final thoughts on re- Reminiscence. John? I gave it six fifty. Okay, Troy? I liked it enough to give it a 7. I liked it enough to give it a 7 as well. And I got to say, I mean, you know, Lisa Joy, I, I almost feel bad for her because she's she's married to Jonathan Nolan and Jonathan Nolan's brother is Christopher Nolan. And you're all, and you're coming from Westworld, which was, you know, a huge, a heady, huge success for HBO already. So, I mean, it's hard to then jump into a feature. You got a lot of pressure from all sides, I would say. You know, a lot of people are measuring you up unfairly to some degree. I think she did a great job for her feature debut. Like, yeah, there's so much beauty here for me 
that I, I really would love to see what she does next. Yeah, it's like Dan Trachtenberg doing 10 Cloverfield Lane. Mm. And you just go like, like man, like that was so different and better than I even thought it could be. Uh, it, I think that's the same experience here where I think people just don't know what they're getting into. And because it's new, they shy away from it or they try to put it down when at the same time, the people that are just willing to give it a chance are the ones that are going to find a very, very pleasant surprise for uh, an under two hour movie. Also, by the way. Yep. Enjoyed it. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our podcast this week. Let me know, like, if you like reviews at the end. I was just kind of playing with the format and seeing what if we did reviews at the end? Because some people don't want to be spoiled. Some people don't want to know if that's something that matters to you. If it's not because you prefer like outtakes and stuff, <laughs> you want to end on a high note. You want to end on laughs. You want to end on jokes, whatever. Let us know. I'm just kind of really curious what you think about that really minor, but maybe big change. I don't know. That's going to do it for this episode though. Hey guys, thanks for not giving a shit that I was gone for a week. I really appreciate that. <laughs> not one, yeah. not one person asked about you. Wow, dude. Like that is not even necessary. I already lost my phone in the goddamn pool. I lost all my Alaska pictures and then I got to come back and get insulted by you. You're an unlikable character that I also love. I appreciate that. Aw. So I turned that around, but you're also a dick because you said that and that's just mean. And who does that when someone- That's because you picked on me because it wasn't my fault that the three minutes, the best three minutes were missing. It's Google's. Screw you, Google. So you're, you're actually, hang on, your actual argument still at the end of the show is that Google went in and took three minutes out of your file. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what happened. hundred percent. Didn't you upload the a, wrong one, like the unfinished one or something like that? Nope, did not. Are you sure? Upload Are you lying positive, right now? Do we have a lie detector? Can we get the little pass machine? Here, you can, you, can, you can feel my finger in your, in your camera right here. <laughs> I... This is, I don't want to pull your finger and I don't want to smell it. I don't want to touch it. Nothing. Get your finger away from me. I'll put my butt up to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, there you go. There's your explanation for last week. Google deleted three minutes of our podcast for no reason other than just the just jack with Troy. And because it was the three minutes that Aaron told us specifically we weren't supposed to do. So maybe yeah. it was a protection buffer on Aaron's part. It might be. That's very possible. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Come back. Uh, we're going to have a Fantasia Festival wrap up on next week's episode. And thank you so much for listening. And remember, the next time you go to a theater or sit comfortably on your couch and watch something on streaming, buy popcorn. <laughs> Or just pop it. No, I still think you should buy it. Microwave popcorn is really bad for you. I don't eat microwave popcorn. I pop it. Does microwave popcorn. What do you, like Jiffy Pop? Is that what you go get that old? No, I take we that. buy like actual kernels and put them in an air popper and make our own butter and salt. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, you get one of those those flat iron like poppers that yeah. has the thing that spins. The and spinner. The, heat, the, the flat iron heats up and starts, and it's got that giant bowl shape on top of it so that you can just flip it over and everything's already in the bowl. Yep. That is the that is the a miracle device ever made, if I yep. do not say so myself. It's the cooker and the bowl that you eat it out of in the same device. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's magical. It just sounds like something John would burn his goddamn house down with. I don't have a house. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That went grim. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care, guys. <laughs>